There we go. Okay, so welcome to OzFest, everybody. Um, we'll go to five and we're gonna try to cover as much stuff as we can. This will be a content review. We've been doing skills based in class. Um, so our story to go back to the beginning goes all the way back. Um, and really the slide here, um, let me share my screen, slide three, really it says it starts at 1607, but really we go back a little before that. We're gonna go back all the way to pre-Columbian Native American history. So we start with 1491 and 1491 is a shorthand for everything that happened prior to that time. So going way, way back um, during the last ice age, some 10,000 years ago, uh, there was a land bridge or an ice bridge in between Siberia Alaska allowing people from the Asian continent to migrate into North America and then South America. So this was some 10,000 years ago. Uh, they populated both continents and um, they you know, fanned out to every square end of both continents and, uh, and contributed a lot to um, the development of the Americas. Probably their greatest contribution to human beings was cultivation of corn. Um, this was a huge achievement. It took thousands and thousands of years to selectively breed this crop over time. You know, we talk about, you know, um, sort of genetic tinkering with crops. A lot of modern corporations do this, but it's actually a very old practice um, in, you know, sort of the selective breeding of, of animals and, um, and agriculture to, uh, to achieve this. And it was an incredible achievement. Corn produces more calories per acre than any other grain. And so that sustains populations. And so that was the major staple crop of the Americas. Potatoes came from South America, corn largely from North America. But beyond that, uh, Native Americans um, in certain locales, like in the Pacific Northwest, that'd be Oregon, Washington State, largely they fished. Uh, in the Southwest where it's more desertous, they had to build, um, you know, uh, sort of fortresses in the mountains to defend from, from other tribes. Uh, they um, lived along river systems in those desert areas where they could kind of irrigate their crops a little bit. So you had uh, Native American tribes like the Pueblo, the Anasazi, the Navajo in the Southwest. They had kind of a different style of living. And then everything pretty much east of the Mississippi Native Americans there largely um, lived amongst a wooded environment. They hunted, they gathered, they moved with the season. They did do agriculture. They grew beans, squash, corn, tomatoes, vegetables in gardens, but they would always move with the season following the herd, building kind of temporary shelters that would last three to six months and then move. Not, not always moving far, not always moving hundreds or thousands of miles, sometimes just five or 10 miles certain area where the hunting ground had moved. Um, and so this was essentially um, the, uh, the lifestyle, the economics of, of Native American tribes. They had built small boats, you know, canoes and things like that. They had not really mastered ocean going travel. Um, and they had none of these European institutions that we would associate with kind of an advanced society. There was no banking system. They had really, you know, not much of a, a monetary or currency system. Some did, you know, um, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, Native American tribes would use seashells and other things like that so that they could trade. Mostly it was a barter and trade economy, um, but no banking, no metallurgy of any kind. That is the ability to melt down metals and fashion them into tools and stuff. Mostly they used, um, you know, wooden tools some metal tools that, you know, some pieces of metal that had kind of naturally shaped, they might shave it down a little bit, but not making them hammers or saws or anything like that. Um, and really no written languages to speak of. This is why a lot of this uh, is determined from fossil records and other means. Native Americans didn't really write anything down because they didn't have a written language or almost none of them did. Some of the South American uh, tribes they had written records, but um, not much, not much at all. So um, this is largely, you know, uh, the contribution and the existence of these peoples throughout the Americas. They, it was 
fairly densely populated. Cities like Tenochtitlan had something like two, three hundred thousand people in the 1400s, much bigger than any European city at the time. Uh, it was quite extraordinary. Um, so the European people start to arrive. The first are the Spanish. The Spanish will arrive, of course, in 1492 with Columbus. Why Spain? Why is Spain the first of these European nations to arrive? Mostly because they were the first to unify. Although technically France was unified a little before that and England was unified a little before that, they had their own internal issues. England, although unified, had not conquered Wales until the 1400s and didn't unify with Scotland until 1707. They were dealing with problems in Ireland uh, and they were dealing with their neighbor France. France likewise was worried with all of their neighbors. And so Spain really, because of their own colonization, because Muslim Moors from North Africa had conquered Spain, that caused them to unite all of the peoples, all the Christian peoples of Spain, drive out the Moors. And by 1492, they were unified. They had solidified a whole nation with centralized taxation and they could raise a whole bunch of money so they could build ships, purchase weapons, and look for new trade routes to Asia because they wanted to trade with China to buy silks and spices and porcelain and things like that. And the Ottoman Turks were not letting them unless they paid this huge finder's fee, so to speak, sort of a middleman fee. And so they thought, you know, we could swing around the Horn of Africa like the Portuguese do, but there were problems with that, namely the Portuguese. And so they hired Columbus to sail west to find the east. And uh, he got lucky. Had there been no Americas in the way, surely his voyage would have ended with devastation because from Spain all the way to China is some 11,000 miles or something. They did not have the food or the resources to get there. Luckily the, for him anyway, the Americas were there some 3,000 miles to the west of, uh, of Spain and they landed in Santa Domingo and they start the colonization process. They conquer, they look for gold, they brutally you know, dominate the peoples there. And they have this style of frontier of inclusion, society of inclusion. This is an important concept. What it means is that the native population is included in that society, not in a positive way, but in an inferior way. We're gonna dominate you, you are the labor force. You're gonna mine for gold, you're gonna work the sugar plantations. Women, you're gonna be the brides, you're gonna be the mothers of the children of the conquerors. Um, and, uh, and we want you to learn Spanish. We want you to Catholic and there's no declining this. You're just going to have to do it. And so you see a blending of these cultures together. In fact, Catholicism in Mexico is very different than Catholicism in Europe. This is because a lot of the Aztec uh, traditions, religious concepts were sort of fused together with, um, with Catholicism. And so you see a lot of that there. Same thing with cuisine. You see a lot of the Aztec and Native American cuisine got blended into Mexican dishes. In the English speaking world, it was very different. Um, so the Spanish are going to fan out and conquer this uh, huge empire that stretches from Mexico and, you know, California up in the north, all the way through Central America, through South America. The only kind of exceptions would be Brazil. Um, sort of the northeast coast of Canada where the French would land and then the eastern seaboard of North America where the Dutch and English would land. And so half of the North American and South American continents lay in Spanish hands. They were the feared empire in the 1500s. Everybody hated them, not just Protestant nations, but other Catholic nations like the French hated them as well and feared them. And so this spurred those competitive countries to go out and to make empires of their own. Um, remember, how mercantilism works, that each colonizing power wants resources. They want to extract gold, silver, lumber, everything, all the wealth of, uh, of a society, but also a controlled market so you can dump your goods. That way you don't have to compete with, uh, with other nations in that area, right? In Mexico, Spain could say, you must buy these Spanish manufactured goods. You can't buy from anyone else because we control the ports and we won't allow it. And so England, France, Holland felt we got to get in on this too. And so they started this process as well. It will look a little different in those areas. They tried to find gold. They tried to find silver. By and large, the Spanish found it all. Uh, there are rumors, 
Native American tribes realize that the Spanish wanted gold, that they would point them in other directions and say, no, 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 we don't have it here, but there's this story of El Dorado, the city of gold. It's a little bit over to the east. If you just look for it there, you'll find it. And so the Spanish multiple conquistadors fan out all over the American continent looking for gold, and they don't really find very much of anything. Uh, it's found in Mexico, it's found in Peru, but very little gold or silver found anywhere else. But this does not stop the Spanish and it doesn't stop the other powers. The English eager to get their hands on gold show up. They have you know, chemists there that, that can test for gold, but they don't bring really any farmers that are gonna grow food or anything like that. And that led to a near collapse of these other columns. Jamestown would be founded in 1607. That's kind of our first year that I put up here because that's when the English colonial process starts. Um, England is in search of gold, they're in search of silver, they're in search of controlled markets. So they found this little fledgling colony, only about 500 people at first. And it was a near total disaster in those first couple of years because of mosquitoes, there's malarial infections in May through September. There's, um, it's on an estuary where the salt water meets uh, the fresh water. And so any wells that you dig are often contaminated with salt water, so fresh water is always hard to find. Um, the weather is freezing in uh, Virginia and, uh, and people freeze to death in the winter time. Not enough farmers are producing food. And so this just leads to complete disaster. There was an 80% death rate in that first decade or so, meaning 80% of the colonists died every year. And the only thing that kept Jamestown alive is that a new sort of fresh crop of colonists showed up every spring. Every May, there would be three or four boatloads of another five or 600 people who would dwindle and largely die off. And there'd be 60, 70, 80 left over by the next spring and a whole new you know, crop of people would come in, which tells you how bad things were in England where they still could recruit people to go even though the death rates were so appalling. Two types of people are coming to Virginia. The super rich, who aren't really nobility, but they're related to the nobility. They're the second, third, fourth sons of the nobility. They're frustrated in England um, and they wanted something of their own. So they go to Virginia, they get to be big landowners and, and politicians there. The other group is sort of desperate poor folks. They're not slaves because slavery doesn't exist in England itself, um, but they're indentured servants. They're poor, desperate folks that have sold themselves into a temporary form of slavery or, or you know, indentured servitude. Um, they sell themselves for five to seven years. The prospect is that you work that long and then you become free and you get your quote, freedom dues. You get 40 acres of land, you get a draft animal like a mule, you get a, a plow um, and you get a gun, the symbol of kind of adult manhood in the European continent. Remember peasants, landless people could not own firearms, but the rich could. This is um, one of those weird things that's handed down to today, where in America, anyone can own a firearm. In Britain, it's very limited, only you know, very few people, and only if you're like fox hunting and stuff like that. And so therefore, almost nobody owns firearms in Great Britain because they're not used to it. Hardly anybody ever could. Uh, in America, it was very different. It was a broader middle class. Anyone who was a free landowner could. And so everybody practically can and does in America. Um, so after, little over a decade of searching for gold, they decide we need to give up on this endeavor and instead we're going to um, plant tobacco. The Spanish had uh, monopolized the global trade in tobacco. It was very hard to find. And John Rolfe shows up. He must have bought them off some Spanish merchant or something, but he shows up with seeds, plants them, and it just takes off like crazy. And that made the colony sustainable. The death rate slows down, it dwindles. And that made Jamestown very viable. Tobacco was so much the lifeblood of Virginia that it was quite literally their currency. Everything was weighed in tobacco. Like a slave's price was in leaves of tobacco. People were paid in pounds of tobacco. Um, it was everything there, which kind of interesting. Other times this happens too. You might've seen movies where in prison, you know, cigarettes are the currency. Um, after World War II, the currency of Germany collapsed. And so GIs, American GIs in Berlin will often, you know, pay people with American Lucky Strike cigarettes because they were, you know, the only currency around. Um, so this really builds America. Um, Maryland right next door is kind of a carbon copy of Virginia. The only difference 
is that most of the residents of Maryland are Catholic. They were English Catholics who were oppressed in their own country. Most of them were very wealthy landowners and, and nobility, but always suspicious after the Henrician Reformation, as it's known, the, the Reformation of Henry VIII, Protestant, Protestantism took over England. And anyone who was Catholic was suspect because that's the religion of our enemies. That's the Spanish and the French. No, nobles were not forced to convert, but they were always discriminated against. Remember when you're a nobleman, you get a, a, a commission in the army and or navy. Couldn't get that if you were Catholic. Couldn't be an advisor to the king. And so a lot of these people left. There were only, only about four or 5,000 of them in England by the 1600s. Almost everyone else converted. But you could have a little escape valve and go to Maryland and be a big tobacco, tobacco plantation owner there. Notice already you're seeing this difference, or you should, that in Spain, it's the loyal followers of the king. You had to be Catholic, you had to be male, you had to you know, pledge loyalty to the king. In England, it's kind of the misfits. It's the people that don't fit into society. It's the people that don't get along with the king and are, are kind of an oppressed class. And the king kind of feels like, yeah, the colonies, I'm not interested in that. You just go ahead and go there. Notice no direct taxation from the English. The Spanish had the quinto. You had to pay one fifth of everything back to the crown. And largely they're left to their own devices to govern themselves. Landowners are elected in every one of these um, colonies. And so they're salutary neglect. They're much more independent even before the revolution. Okay. Um, going to Pennsylvania, we got the Quakers there. Pennsylvania is acquired a bit later in, um, in the 1660s. Um, and it's acquired by Charles II um, after the restoration, after Oliver Cromwell and the Republic falls apart. And Charles gave it to his younger brother, James, the Duke of York. Later on, he'll be known as James II. James named it after his, his title, which was the Duke of York. It gets very confusing, but if you follow this, like the royal family, they have these weird sort of titles, like um, Prince Philip just died recently, like a month ago, and he was known as the Duke of Edinburgh. It's always like the prince who's married to the queen gets that title. Um, Prince Charles is, is known as the Prince of Wales. Um, I know that William's wife, Kate, is the Duchess of Sussex. And so you get all these titles depending on who you're married to or whatever. The younger brother of the king is usually known as the Duke of York, which I believe is Prince Andrew today. I'm actually embarrassed that I know this much about the royal family, but they are so scandalous, are they not? It's fun to check them out. Um, so Pennsylvania, known for its tolerance, founded by Quakers. Quakers were a pacifist sect, be believing in nonviolence. They don't believe in violence under almost any circumstance. And um, they weren't very welcome in England. They were considered kind of wacky and cuckoo. They did not have um, a, an ordained minister. They didn't believe in ecclesiastical authority, like God selects a minister and then the minister gives you benedictions, right? Ministers give you blessings so that you can enter heaven. If you don't get, you know, your christening, if you don't get uh, the last rites, if you don't get communion, then you don't get to go to heaven. Quakers said, no, we don't do that. Anyone can be a preacher. So I think I mentioned they would sort of what I call popcorn preach. They would just say, hey, I'm going to stand up and preach the Holy Spirit's in me. And so they didn't subscribe to these kind of rigid, you know, religious uh, uh, understandings. Um, and so all of these values are imbued into their capital, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. They allowed freedom of religion. They believed in tolerance. Unfortunately, they were too tolerant because they said, we're against slavery, but we want to be tolerant to slave owners, so we'll allow it. Bit of a mistake there, I would say. Um, and uh, they built a very thriving colony there. It becomes the breadbasket of the new world. Pennsylvania is a lot of wide, flat land that's very good for farming, much better than New England. So it becomes sort of, you know, the grain capital of North America, lots of grain farmers there. And Philadelphia, believe it or not, is the biggest city during the colonial period. At the time of the revolution, there were 30,000 people living in Philadelphia, which doesn't sound impressive to us today, but you got to realize it was 1776 and that qualified as a pretty big city, right? That's, that's like a neighborhood in Long Beach, right? Probably there's about 50,000 people just in Los Altos and in Long Beach, but 1700s, right? Um, so that's Pennsylvania, that's the Quakers. Uh, what about New England? New England will be much different. Um, so New England's in the Northeast at the colonial period. It starts with Massachusetts and then fans out to its neighbors. Um, it will become Massachusetts, New Hampshire, 
Rhode Island, Connecticut during the colonial period. And then after the revolution, we will add Vermont. And then after 1820, Maine will be cut off from the rest of Massachusetts to become its own state. And so that's New England today. Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine. Okay. And they're very similar. It's almost like I think of like Oregon and Washington as almost the same state. They're very similar. Washington, or sorry, uh, Seattle and Portland are kind of sister cities. They're roughly the same size, similar weather, similar ethnic composition. Um, and so New England's a lot like that. State to state, it's very much the same. Meaning, if you're in Vermont, you root for the Red Sox, right? If you're in Maine, you root for the Patriots. It's, you know, it's just understood that New England's all kind of one, even though they're separate states, they, ha they have a lot in common. They're founded by Puritan dissidents. Um, the most insane of them, the most um, you know, uh, strident of them are the pilgrims. They are Puritan separatists. They will come first in 1620. And they are essentially religious refugees. They wanted to purify the Church of England of its sort of Catholic traditions that it still has. They, they broke, the Church of England broke in the 1500s with the Catholic Church, but they held on to a lot of the same traditions. And what happened was starting in the 1570s, 1580s, Bibles started to be translated into English, the first being the Geneva Bible, and then King James in the 1600s authorized the King James Bible to be published. People started reading the Bible and they wanted to tear everything down. They said, wait a minute, we have the communion table in the wrong place. We have stained glass windows. We do this, we do that. I've read the Bible now. We shouldn't be doing those things. So this is sort of proof positive that the Catholic Church was right. If you let people read the Bible, it will destroy the authority of the church because people will question everything. They'll say, wait a minute, you didn't tell us this was in you know, the word of God. It says something different than what you claimed it said. And so this was the pilgrims. They were pretty angry about the way things were in their church. They got upset. They didn't have autonomy in their church to kind of run it as they saw fit because the king was head of the church and, and the head of their government. And so they left. First, they went to Holland and they realized that was even worse because they could practice their own religion how they wanted, but their children were sort of leaving them and sort of joining mainstream moderate society. This happens a lot in America, right? A lot of people, they leave persecution, they go to America and their kids leave their culture and they become American. Um, and so they didn't want this to happen. So they left Holland and they decided to go to Massachusetts where there were no outside Europeans that would influence the way they were. They were Native Americans, so certainly. But that's the pilgrims. Um, they were pretty extreme. There were only about 120 of them, the most extreme 120 you know, religious fanatics you could find in England, and they land in Massachusetts. They look for Virginia to plant tobacco. They missed. So tobacco would not take. It would not grow in the soil, so they had to get creative. The starving time that I mentioned just a little while ago for Virginia, that doesn't happen in Massachusetts. They, they do have some difficulties, but they don't have this appalling 80% death rate because whatever you wanna say about the Puritans, they were hardworking people. And they went to work and they said, well, if tobacco doesn't plant, we're gonna to have to grow our own food. We're gonna to have to get creative. And so they did. They started building kind of a multifaceted economy. But this other group, which is very similar to them, the Puritans, it's a much larger group and they're a bit more watered down they have similar belief of the pilgrims, but they were willing to work with Charles. They just said, well, we disagree with him, but we're still loyal Englishmen and Englishmen. And we just want to try to petition the king to change his ways. They're going to arrive about a decade later, starting about 1629. And there's a wave of about 20 years, 1629 to 1639, where some 20,000 Puritans left England and went to Massachusetts. Um, now understand that for every one Puritan that came to Massachusetts, 99 stayed in England or they just emigrated to Ireland just right next door. So we're gonna get the wackiest, most extreme people in England. Very hardworking, uh, their, their, their colony will eventually kind of swallow up the other one that was there. The, the pilgrims would found Plymouth, the um, Puritans would found Massachusetts Bay and because of the overall size of it, it just kind of merges with the group that was already there, the pilgrims, and you know, becomes Massachusetts and then all of New England. Very hardworking and very creative. They decided, you know, if tobacco doesn't grow, we're going to grow our own food, but also we'll have other businesses. We will 
import sugar from the Caribbean and make molasses and rum from it. We will build, we will open shipping firms. We will do anything and everything. We're gonna have barrel makers and tanners. Um, we are going to um, chop down trees to make lumber. One of the greatest stories that really shows you the sort of Yankee um, work ethic is that waste was sinful to Puritans. You didn't waste anything. You didn't throw any food away. And uh, they felt that sawdust was a huge waste from the lumber business, that you had these sawmills and you would be chopping lumber and all the sawdust would be a by byproduct. And what could you do other than throw it away? Well, they figured out, some smart Yankee figured out that you can take ice or snow when it you know, snows in the wintertime, pack it around like fruits and vegetables and other kind of things in a crate, and then you insulate it with sawdust and it would keep for weeks sometimes, depending on the weather. And now they could sell sawdust. Like who would think? You would just think it's a wasteful kind of thing. Puritans were just really good businessmen and business women. And they had kind of a knack for no waste, working hard and let's find a way to improve our lives. And so they develop a very you know thriving area of the country. New England has almost always been the richest area of the country. Richest state per capita, Connecticut. Um, highest standard of living, New England. That's the region where people live the longest, have best access to healthcare. It's a shame the weather is so miserable because it's kind of a cool place, but I don't think I could ever move to Boston. It's just too cold for me. Plus those Red Sox fans are just annoying. I can't stand those people. Not as bad as Yankee fans, but they're pretty bad. Um, okay, so... Um, they're deeply religious, and this means that they all can read. They have very high literacy rates. They opened the first university in America. 1636, Harvard opens up. Talk about an old university, right? They value education. They valued self-improvement. They had these kind of what, what we consider today all American values, hard work, determination, thrift, investment, improving the lives of your children. And that sort of Yankee spirit is just universal in America, pretty much, at least we all claim to value it. Um, so what else can we say here? Uh, very intolerant. They claimed, you know, we're here to uh, be sort of a religious refuge for everybody. But people that weren't Puritans that came to New England were treated miserably. Probably the people that got it the worst were the Quakers. People who uh, were of the Quaker sect would be um, tortured, they'd be imprisoned. Um, one of the more shocking things that I was reading is this document that was showing all the punishments just for being a Quaker, just for not going to Puritan church. Uh, you would be chained to a log in an outside prison in February in the middle of winter, right? They would have just these big walls surrounding this you know, prison yard and that would be your punishment. Sometimes they put you in the pillory. The pillory is that thing where you kind of, you have to bend over and you put your wrist through and your head through and it just kind of locks you in a bent over position for a week. And then they let you go and you're, back's all messed up and you can't stand up straight, right? So not very tolerant people. <laughs> the, there's a bit of a mythology here that America was founded on freedom of religion. Um, not really. It was the freedom of religion for Puritans to practice, but anyone who came to their colony, you gotta be just like us. Freedom of religion doesn't really come to the colonies until the 1700s. Uh, of course, in both uh, Virginia, and in Pennsylvania and in New England, there was conflict with the Native American tribes, pretty much just over land use. Europeans were farmers, Native Americans used the land differently. It was really incompatible. No written record system, no court system to determine who the land actually was. So this created conflict after conflict. In uh, Jamestown, these conflicts were known as the Powhatan War. In New England, it was known as the Pequot War in the 1630s and then King Philip's War later on. And so this was an ongoing theme. All, often Native Americans could defeat the Europeans, but because the Europeans had disease on their side, because there were so many more coming every day, they were eventually able to, uh, to win that conflict. So um, the Glorious Revolution. Um, England is, is, compared to France, much more stable in its government. It's rather extraordinary that after the Glorious Revolution, we don't need to get into all the details, but this is the one where King William and Queen Mary, they, they were in Holland. They were invited by the parliament to come in and get rid of James. James was a Catholic. He was also a tyrant. Parliament hated him. Colonists hated him. And so he would be overthrown by the parliament in 1688. And they have all these reforms. And so now in the English constitution, 
the monarchy must be Protestant. And there's all kinds of freedoms now. There's freedom of speech, right to a fair trial. Parliament has to meet every couple of years, et cetera. And so Britain has operated under that framework of government down to this day. I mean, it's rather striking. I, we're proud of our revolution or our constitution. Theirs is even older. Um, and they've had no revolution, coup, or invasion since 1688, which is extraordinary. Um, France, on the other hand, they had a revolution in 1789, and then a monarchy, and then a revolution, and then a monarchy, and then a republic. They just went back and forth constantly. They're on their fifth republic now. Britain's still on their first. Uh, I guess technically they're not a republic. They're a, a constitutional monarchy, but you, know, you get the point. Um, and so they're very proud of this revolution in England, if you're unaware of this. Um, this really solidified kind of modern Britain. And the, the um, genius of this revolution, the philosopher, is John Locke. John Locke wrote a lot of philosophical treatises in the 1680s about no taxation without representation, about having representation in parliament to challenge the authority of the monarch, the king. Um, about right to a fair trial and all of that kind of stuff. And those are ideas that will be handed down to us, uh, to our founding fathers and our revolution. Okay, next slide's just a little, you know, map of, of this particular area so you can get your bearings. Oops, sorry about that. So this is New England right here. Okay, you got Massachusetts. Remember Maine, still part of Massachusetts at this time. We got New Hampshire, we got Rhode Island here, we got Connecticut. This is where all the dissidents were sent, right? Massachusetts is like pure Puritans. And, and remember, Puritans is what other people called them. They called themselves Congregationalists. So each of these colonies has like an official Congregationalist church. But the ones in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire were watered down and much more mellow. People would be like, hey, do we really need to torture the Quakers? And they would say, what's wrong with you? Are you a Quaker? And they would be kicked out, right? Almost like our Red Scare, our, you know, 1950s era, everyone calling each other communists. Everybody would be like, are you a Catholic? Are you a Quaker? Or are you not a Congregationalist? And so Rhode Island is known for having more tolerance than Massachusetts because Roger Williams was kicked out and he set up a much more tolerant Congregationalist church there. Um, we've got our mil middle colonies here, which I guess we didn't really talk about New York and New Jersey. We did Pennsylvania, but they're here. They're going to be the most diverse, the most tolerant. Uh, and then we get the Chesapeake, we get Virginia and Maryland, Delaware, if it mattered, it's right here too. Uh, and then we get the Deep South, the Carolinas and Georgia, which we haven't quite gotten to yet. So let's talk about New York. So New York is founded by the Dutch. It's New Amsterdam at first. The Dutch are even more sophisticated, more rich per capita than England is. It's a Protestant country, but very free. The reason why they were just not destined to win in any of these colonial wars is they're such a small country. I think Holland's population is 11 or 12 million today. It's a pretty small European country um, compared to its giant neighbors. You know, Germany has like 80 million people. England and France have about 67, 68 million people. And then little Holland has like 11 million. Um, but it's a very wealthy country. The Dutch are one of the richest countries per capita. They are the tallest country. Uh, in the world because they're access to good diet at a young age, good health care. And they're going to found New York and New Jersey. They're going to call it New Amsterdam, named after their capital. And actually, it's the least important corner of their empire. Uh, Indonesia is probably the most important. They will conquer Indonesia. They'll call it the Dutch East Indies. They're going to plant sugar and spice plantations there and make a fortune. And the Dutch East India Company will make untold riches from this. A private company that had an empire. It had a fleet. It went out and conquered. And it, it conquered huge sections of the world. They will colonize South Africa and they will colonize New Amsterdam and New Jersey. Now, they will land in the 1620s and you know they thrive there for a while, but the English were very jealous. You know, the English had this huge set of colonies here in New England, uh, and they had ones just south of New York and New Jersey and the Chesapeake and, and the South. And so Charles II felt. I got to unify this, you know, this area and kick out the Dutch. So in 1664, he sends the fleet to uh, New Amsterdam, threatens to destroy it if they don't surrender, and the governor immediately just surrendered, Peter Stuyvesant. The English were very lenient. All the white landowners could keep their land, so all the Dutch were treated rather well. They said, keep your land holdings, that's fine. We will just hold the fortresses and we'll be the government now. The English could now immigrate to that society, but the original Dutch landowners 
kept their land and they are still the wealthy there. It's very interesting to see these old Dutch families, even today, very powerful in New York. Um, so you know, that's all we really need to say about it right now. Uh, New York would become the most um, diverse and, and, and one of the most tolerant of the colonies. Pennsylvania is probably a bit more tolerant, but New York is uh, diverse. And then uh, we got the Deep South. Um, so the South will be different than all the other regions. Even though Virginia and Maryland had slavery, there was a large number of yeoman farmers. Slaves never represented more than about 22% of the population of the Chesapeake, even in the 1700s, sort of the century of slavery. In the South, it would be a slave society. The areas along the coast are very marshy and swampy, very good for growing indigo and rice. The inland area is very good for tobacco. So areas like Georgia and South Carolina were 55 to 60% slave, only about uh, 40 to 45% free. Um, and so they develop very differently. So that, that, that model that becomes Confederacy and then later the modern South is very much built up in that colonial period there. And it's in contrast with the other parts of the country. They're very different, um, as I think you know. Carolinas were again founded by Charles II. There was a big fear that Virginia and Maryland, the Chesapeake, would be threatened by Spanish Florida, uh, that Florida might start to move into that area. So he moved in there first. English landowners from the Caribbean come in and they conquer the area. They bring their slaves with them and they thrive and they do very well. Um, let's move on and talk about slavery and, and its foundation in America because it's so important to our history. This um, project the New York Times did, uh, very controversial, but it's interesting, it's called the 1619 Project. And it's, it's basically a project about the legacy of slavery and how much slavery really shaped modern America. We don't like to admit it, but it's a huge, huge part of our history that still echoes and reverberates down to today. That it's not like slavery was incidental to America. It's not just something that happened. It was a shaping and driving factor and a, and a dominating factor through much of our history, uh, at least in the South, we could say. So how did slavery develop? Why did it develop? Well, at first, as I had said before, that indentured servants were the first slaves or forced you know, laborers in America. And even though slaves are brought, in 1619, the first boatload of slaves from Africa, some 20 or so uh, African slaves are brought over. They were a bit of a curiosity and exception. No one was exactly sure, you know, do we use slaves? Do we not? Because people preferred to have English indentured servants. They already spoke English. They had farming you know, knowledge already. They were easy to acquire. Um, and people just preferred that. The big turning point will be Bacon's Rebellion, is that one of these uh, English landowners comes over from England, wants to get in the political system, is not really allowed. So he starts a rebellion amongst really angry indentured servants who were told you would get land when you became free. But that agreement was torn up because there was conflict with the Powhatan nation. Uh, the Governor Berkeley of the Virginia colony said, you know what, we're going to make peace. We're not going to allow any more indentured servants when they're free to own land so we can make peace with you. And these indentured servants led by Bacon rise up. They conquer Jamestown and they burn it down to the ground. Uh, now the rebellion peters out because Bacon dies of dysentery and the you know, leaderless, the, the movement kind of peters out. But the next spring in 1677, the English decided we can't allow this to happen. Eng English indentured servants are just too troublesome. They have high expectations that they'll become free. And the, the most dangerous thing politically in the world is people with high expectations. It, when you're a government, you always want to keep expectations low. You always want to say, hey, elect me. It'll get a little bit better, right? Because if you promise all this stuff and you don't deliver, people get very angry and they rebel. That's pretty much the source of all rebellions in history is expectations that are not met. So the South especially was an agrarian society uh, that required quite a bit of labor year round, particularly sugar plantations in Brazil and the Caribbean. And so it was felt in order to really exploit the land and get the most money, one had to use a forced system of labor. Remember that I've told you this is unfortunate that nature works this way. It's a very cruel system, but it is true that agricultural work is always harder 
to do than industrial work. Industrial work is not susceptible to seasons. You can have a strike for a week or a month or six months and just go right back to work. And, you know, it's not going to destroy the company necessarily. If you have a strike that lasts even a day or two on a farm, it might destroy the crop for the whole year. And then people starve or there's a shortage of, of whatever cash crop you're producing because nature is cruel that way. You need to tend to the crops every single day. And so agricultural workers are never given the free and equal rights that industrial workers are. I'm, I wish it weren't the case, but it's very much the case even today. Think of America. What is the worst job you could probably have in America? Agricultural work. It pays the least. You get the least benefits. You get the least freedom. Because again, if, if workers have too many rights, then, and you guys might say, well, that's cruel and everything. Well, how would you feel if, you know, I told you, hey, this season, there's like eight crops that just, you won't find them anywhere. You won't find strawberries, blueberries, apples, mangoes, uh, you know, rice or sugar this year at all. It just won't be in the stores. You guys would probably freak out as would your parents, right? Um, certainly workers' rights could be better than they are. Uh, and, and it's not an excuse for slavery, but some systems are just, they're, they're more susceptible to this kind of exploitation and agriculture is certainly one of those. So indentured servants were used first after Bacon's Rebellion, it was decided this isn't gonna work. Now they could have used Native Americans, they decided not to because Native Americans didn't have immunities to diseases, so there weren't as many of them. You would have to capture tribes and enslave them. In Africa, slave markets already existed before Europeans came over. Okay, Europeans did some awful evil things, but they didn't invent slavery in Africa. It already existed and they were more than willing to sell to European peoples. So it was easy. Africans had the immunities to European diseases and Africans had agricultural knowledge. They had grown sugar and tobacco and all this other stuff in Africa. So despite the language barrier, it was like, oh yeah, we have that knowledge. Um, so slaves were purchased in the 1600s and then really in the 1700s, African slaves really replace and you hardly see any indentured servants after 1700. You see a few here and there, but not that much anymore. So slavery would look different in different regions. It would be a brutal system throughout, but almost anything, you, there's gradients, there's, you know, um, there's levels to it, right? You could, like with any, we have gradients for, for homicide, right? It's like we don't treat every intentional killing of someone or even unintentional killing of someone the same, right? It's like if you intend to kill them and you plan it ahead, that's first degree. If you intend harm, but you didn't, don't intend to kill or, or you intend to kill, but it's a snap judgment, that's second degree. If you intend harm, but not kill, then it's lower. So we, we make these distinctions with almost everything. And with slavery, it's very similar. The worst of the slavery systems was the sugar plantation system. The sugar plantation systems of Brazil and the Caribbean and Central America were the most god-awful things imaginable. They really were. Workers were worked to death regularly. Within about three to five years, it would be expected that a slave would be worked, not taken care of very well. Um, they were a disposable workforce. Because sugar was grown year round, because there was so much profit, you could just buy a new one at the end of that five years. Tobacco plantations in Virginia did not reap as much profits. The season was much shorter. And so you had to take care of the slaves a bit better, not because you're a nicer master, but just because the economics of the situation. So slaves lived longer in the Chesapeake. Therefore, slavery looked different. Um, by 1700, most slaves in British North America were born in British North America. Very few are what are called saltwater uh, slaves bought from Africa and taken over in the Middle Passage. If you um, had been born in America, you'd be called a Creole, right? You're of African ethnic ethnicity, but you speak English. You're probably Protestant um, because your master converted you and you know nothing else but Virginia. Um, and so slavery would look a lot different in those areas. Um, so what else can we say about uh, slavery there? So um, this also, this system explains why slavery shaped residential patterns or, or just concentrations of where people live. Meaning the closer you get to the equator in our hemisphere, the higher the population of people of African descent, right? Like if you're in Haiti or Cuba, 95% of the population is black. 
if you're in Maine or Vermont or Canada, it's like one or two percent. It's very minimal. This is because the legacy of slavery and cash crops you can't grow cash crops in Vermont. So very few slaves were brought there. You can grow cash crops in Virginia, and, you know, Maryland and um, the Carolinas, Georgia, and especially the Caribbean. So you see the legacy of that, the descendants of slaves still largely living in those places where their ancestors were brought three, 400 years ago. Um, so these slave plantations were part of the mercantilist empire. Uh, England wanted tobacco and they wanted these cash crops. And so they were buying them up and they were legislating with these kind of restrictive laws, the Navigation Acts. Okay, these are part of the mercantilist laws. Navigation Acts would basically say, you know, this ship flying this flag can only go to these ports and trade these goods, right? So the French and Dutch and Spanish would be shut out of American ports. And um, in a weird way, you might say, well, this is very oppressive, but because of salutary neglect, if the heat was on, if it was too hard on merchants and they wanted to get Dutch tea instead, you just had to bribe one of these colonial officials and they'd look the other way. Uh, but also it gave kind of an unfair advantage to British colonists in North America. One of the Navigation Acts said that something like 80% of the crew of the shipping industries have to be British citizens. So if you wanted to join one of these shipping crews in Massachusetts, hey, it was pretty easy to if you were you know, born in America. Um, other people didn't have those kind of luxuries. But you were forbidden from manufacturing iron. You were forbidden from manufacturing wool. Now you could shear your sheep and put it in a bag and ship it to England, but they would spin those in factories and then sell it back to you at 10 times the price, right? Um, American colonists were not supposed to make it. Many did, and they would just bribe these officials. Same thing with hats, same thing with iron, same thing with a lot of stuff. Currency was another one. You weren't supposed to hoard or collect um, English currency, but many people did anyway, to sort of bribe people. Um, this is also the century of wars for empire. The 1700s was the time when great empires were going to war with each other constantly. Uh, the first would be King William's War. Right after the Glorious Revolution, there'd be a big imp uh, imperial war between Catholic and Protestant nations. Um, Queen Anne's War would be the next one. Um, and King George's War, these would just continue throughout. And little corners, pieces would be transferred back and forth, or one empire would get the rights to sell it in another's ports, and this would just go on and on and on. The important thing to note here is that we in British North America were loyal British subjects. We loved our king and queen. And anytime we were asked, you need to go to war with the France and Quebec, uh, with France and Quebec, we would do that. You need to go to war with you know, Spain and Florida. We would do it. We would dutifully put on our uniforms, support the flag and king and country and do it. This would have all, uh, of course, all changed when we get into the next era. So here's another map. This is a map of North America right on the verge of the Seven Years' War, the so-called French and Indian War in America, so just before 1750. So the reddish area on the East Coast, this is British. Okay, you've got a little bit up here in Newfoundland. You've got, you know, Maine down to Georgia. Uh, this is the French Crescent here. Okay, so the blue area there, that, that was colonized by the French right at the same time that um, that the Dutch were going into New Amsterdam and the English are going into Virginia and, and New England. They're gonna come in about 1608 and they're gonna found the city of Quebec right here at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Then they'll sail further up the river and make Montreal. And then all these other areas, you know, along the Great Lakes like Detroit, St. Louis, Louisville, and of course, New Orleans way down here at the mouth of the Mississippi. So this huge area here was controlled by the French, but it's very misleading because the French were never able to stimulate enough of their population to move and settle in that particular region. Strangely enough, life was very good in France, even for landless French agricultural workers, what we would call peasants. French peasants had a bit more freedom than English peasants did. And these stereotypes of the good French life, you know, no matter how poor you were, you could get a nice bottle of red wine, you could get enough bread. This is before the revolution and all the bread riots and stuff. So you know, population surged in France. England and France used to have kind of similar populations. And then the French economy was so strong in the 1600s, it surged. France, on the eve of the French uh, and Indian War, had a population of 20 million people. England only had 7 million. So France was three times the size and pretty comfortable. So 
probably only about 20 to 30,000 French citizens lived in this huge region. On the other hand, how many Englishmen lived in this seaboard area? About one and a half million, so many, many more. So we might say, well, how on earth could France ever win this war? They had alliances with every Native American tribe on the continent, pretty much. There might just be one or two exceptions. I think the Oneidas, the Tuscaroras, that was about it. Every other tribe was allied with the French. And so that was the major population and it kept the English kind of bottled up on the East Coast. Um, remember that the French will come uh, largely as a fur trapping empire. They'll set up you know, fortresses all along this area in Quebec. Um, they will, um, you know, basically say you Native Americans, you know, hunt and trap deer and raccoons and squirrels and bears and stuff like that. You make the furs, we'll buy them from you and we'll give you all these European goods, guns, and liquor and horses and stuff like that. Nice cozy relationship. They got along very well with Native American tribes because there were so few French and they largely left them alone to farm and have the land as they always did. Just the one catch is whenever there's a war between us and England, you got to be on our side. Okay, and again, that legacy is there. Very few Americans understand this or get it, but a fifth of the Canadian population, 20% lives in Quebec, is bilingual to some certain degree, um, and they, they're fiercely independent-minded about this stuff. And many of them will say, I am not Canadian, I'm, I'm Quebecois. I've told you about all the crazy rules there where, you know, Montreal and Quebec, you have to have all your signage in French. You can have English translations, but the English font has to be smaller. Everything in France or in, in Canada has to have the French nutritional information, French instructions. If you ever wonder when you buy a remote control car or Lego set, why does it have French instructions along with English? Like, don't you think Spanish would be more appropriate for California? You can't sell anything in Canada unless you've got French instructions, even in the English speaking provinces, even if you want to sell it in Vancouver, it's got to have French instructions on it. Okay, that's the legacy of the French and Indian War. The French are still angry that they lost that war. As, uh, as you might imagine, the French don't get over things too easily. So let's, um, let's look at this. So one last stop before we get to the French and Indian War, sort of the late colonial uh, period there. Okay, we're an hour through. I guess we're doing okay on time. We, we wanna try to pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, so what can we say about the late colonial era? It's usually charted at the Glorious Revolution, right? Glorious Revolution, 1688, and then all the laws that follow the Toleration Act and King William's War starts in 1689. And then the Salem witch trials are in 1691, 92. And that era is kind of the turning point where you'd say early colonial period, late colonial period. What is typified by the late colonial period? Several things, number one, the enlightenment is that Protestant Europe became much more mellow. They started saying, okay, you can read your own Bible. Bibles would be freely published in English. That had been done for pretty much 100 years at that point. But you could now have a certain amount of freedom of religion, not for Catholics, not for Quakers, but everybody else in the empire, all other Protestants would have freedom of religion. Um, that took place in, in Massachusetts as well. So Puritans could no longer, you know, torture and torment other uh, denominations. They could build their own churches. Um, there was more freedom of speech now. The very famous John Peter Zinger case in the 1740s, he was publishing a newspaper in Boston that criticized the government there and they tried to prosecute him under English law, which said you can prosecute people for criticizing the government. And he said, no, I should be able to do it as long as what I'm saying is true. It used to be you could prosecute someone even what, if what they were saying was true. And now the law changed and they said, well, only if people are defaming the government and printing lies. So it's a huge step forward. They wouldn't do that in New France or New Spain. You could openly criticize the government. That's where we get our notions of, you know, thumbing our nose at authority and criticizing government. We get that from the English. Um, the Plantation Acts, very liberal attitudes towards immigration. You could move to North America in, after 1740 and get British citizenship, the first naturalization law of its kind. And that kind of imbues America with a more tolerant view towards immigration. I know it doesn't always seem that way, but if you look at a snapshot of the world, we're actually pretty darn tolerant. All these liberal countries that you know America imagines are very tolerant, far less tolerant than us. It's very hard to immigrate to Norway or Finland or Ireland or Portugal, practically impossible in a lot of sense. 
good luck trying to immigrate to Japan or, or uh, South Korea, darn near impossible. Um, America, it's still relatively easy, right? Over a million people come here legally every year. Some people come here illegally. And as long as your kid's born here, they're a citizen. Um, that goes back to our history with the Plantation Act. Um, we did Dutch reform already. So um, halfway covenant, we don't need to touch on that. So this will spark the Great Awakening. So remember that the Enlightenment had kind of watered down religion. The Puritans mellowed out amazingly. A hundred years did a lot to sort of get people to forget about the old world, right? Um, New England was founded by people angry at Charles I and Archbishop William Laud. Those men were long dead by the 1730s. Nobody remembered why their you know, grandfather came over. It's kind of like my wife's family. Her parents are incredibly angry at the communist government in Vietnam. Their three children, my wife and my two brothers-in-law, they don't give a damn. They don't pay attention to Vietnamese politics. They're never going to move back to Vietnam. They're Americans. They were born here. So they're not wrapped up in the politics of the old world. They don't listen to Vietnamese radio or follow Vietnamese news. Just like Puritans living in the 1730s probably could not even tell you much about the founding of their Congregationalist church. They started to adopt Arminius of Leyden, who, who kind of, you might say, was Catholic light. He was a Protestant, but he you know, believed in a lot of these Catholic teachings, like the universality of the church, that it wasn't what John Calvin said, where God has to reveal himself to you, and you had an exclusive church, anyone could join, um, that God was a loving father, not this angry, you know, person that loved to torment people uh, with the threat of hell. A lot of conservatives did not like this, but the powerful elites in the church said, we're going to do this. Um, they also got a little bit uh, lax about their sponsorship of the church. You could donate money to the church and get your own mahogany pew with your name etched in it. You could get your own stained glass window with your name in it. And people thought this was idolatry. It was the worshiping of things, you know, straight out of the Old Testament, the worshiping of the golden calf rather than of God. Um, and so this sparked an intense debate. And there was a backlash against all of this. Mr. George Whitefield would come to America uh, and preach in the Anglican church against all of the lax rules of the church. And in the North, John Edwards would preach about going back to the old time Puritan church of the 1630s. Now they're not really gonna win because they were kicked out of these churches and preached outside, but then they collected money and then they made their own churches. So basically here's what it means in New England is you would have the old Congregationalist church, which was much more liberal and progressive than the original one. And you now had a Baptist church which was more conservative than the Congregationalist one, trying to get back to that old time religion, right? And both were claiming, we are the original Congregationalist church that was founded here, and we have the original principles, and both pointed fingers at each other saying, you're the imposter, when really they both thrived and continued on for decades later on. Um, let's see, salutary neglect would allow English colonists, British colonists to have more autonomy than any other people in the world, the only interference you had in your life is your governor was picked by the king, but the governor's salary was chosen by the legislature of that colony. And, um, and that was it, basically. You had to pay, you know, uh, like import duties and regulations at the port, but there was no direct taxation to the parliament. It, it was a pretty sweet life. Colonists living in British North America had the highest standard of living on earth. More people were landowners and lived longer than people in England or anywhere else at the time which is pretty interesting. The American dream right off the bat, you can go to America and rise through the ranks because the abundance of land. So, you know, land wasn't, you know, literally free. It, it was taken violently from the indigenous people, but it did allow people to move up in the system. Um, so lots of land ownership, biggest land ownership class in the world, best literacy rates in the world, uh, largest middle class in the world. There was no nobility in North America, no dukes, duchesses, earls, barons. Um, we had slavery, which was unique. There's a very interesting uh, uh, sociologist from Jamaica who teaches at Harvard now. His name's Orlando Patterson. And it's very interesting. He's argues like, why does America have this, this issue with race? And he says, America was the only modern country that had slavery in its midst. Remember, Britain did not, France did not. They don't have cash crops there and they were overpopulated. They had slavery in their colonies. America was a colony that became its own country and was the only one that had slavery right here where white and black people were living side by side in a slavery society. And that very much shaped us. 
it, it, it's a totally different society than these European ones with respect to, to race. Um, North America had the highest birth rate, even among slaves. Slaves had a self-replicating population as early as 1700, that even if you cut off the Middle Passage and forbade the importation of slaves at that point, you would still expect the slave population to increase naturally through birth rates and low death rates. Much better in the white population for sure. Um, but this was unique to, to North America. Okay, moving on to the French and Indian War. Um, so this is sparked by a conflict if we go back to our map, basically the British seaboard here and the French Crescent started to collide in Western Pennsylvania um, in, in this particular region right outside Pittsburgh. Both sides were claiming it and little skirmishes erupt in 1754 over who controls this land. And you got to hand it to us because we started this war. It was not the British government that started it. It was individual landowners or, or aspiring landowners who moved to Western Pennsylvania because of land shortages. They wanted to gain more access. They ran right into some sentries and forts that were um, set up by the French and Native American allies. They will get themselves into trouble there. And then the king has really no choice but to back us up by sending redcoats to North America and, <clears throat> excuse me, and bolstering us. So congratulations, we got the British into trouble um, and we will win. We don't need to get into the whole history of the conflict, but the British would send some 20,000 redcoats to North America, bail us out. They defeated the French and they conquered all of North America for, for Great Britain. So this was a huge source of pride. Americans were not Americans yet. We were proud British people and oh so proud to be British. We were the freest country in the world, the most prosperous country in the world, and now the threat was gone. We always would sort of go to sleep in terror that the Native Americans and their French ally would come over the Appalachians and conquer us. And so there were all these fortresses there. That's why the Minutemen were created. They would be used later in the revolution, but the church bells in every town would ring out in a certain code, in a certain unison. And that was a sign that every able-bodied man had to get his rifle and show up at the church and go out to go fight the French because they were waiting to conquer us at any moment. That threat was gone now. And, and a lot of it was amplified by the fact that the French were Catholic, and these evil Catholics, right? The Pope, it's a plot to conquer the world and destroy freedom. That was no threat anymore. It was thought that the West would be open for colonization. This would all be wonderful, right? So um, when the war ended, you had a number of problems. Number one, you had the proclamation of 1763. King George III tells us you may not go west of the Appalachians. This was because of Pontiac's rebellion because Native American tribes there were not happy about English colonists moving west. And so the king made this deal and sold out English colonists and we got rather upset, right? We had started the entire war in 1754 to get land in the west and now we're being told, nope, you can't do that. And so we felt betrayed, we felt very angry. And for the first time ever you hear grumblings from uh, British colonists in North America saying, down with the king, we don't like the king, the king is burned in effigy, that's when you make a little dummy and write King George III and you hang it, light it on fire and you protest that way. So this was um, hugely problematical um, for the British and, uh, and it made the colonists very angry. The even bigger problem than that probably was the revenue issues that the British had spent themselves into oblivion over this war. Now it, it helped them very greatly. This built modern Britain. This was the beginning of the Pax Britannica, which Britain would basically dominate global affairs from 1763 to 1947 until the end of World War II. And then they, their empire fell apart that year and they just turned it over to us basically. Um, and so they needed revenue. They didn't money fast. They have 7 million people in their country, but they have 2 million colonists living in British North America who are the richest people in the whole empire and pay no taxes directly to the crown. And so we got very, very upset when we were told, now you have to pitch in your own contributions. And we weren't listening to all the excuses like, we bailed you out in the war and you benefited from this too. And it's only for a few years until we pay off our debt. And no, what is the refrain? no taxation without representation. We believed in John Locke and these ideas that if you don't have a seat in the parliament, if you don't have representation, then you cannot um, tax people. You can't take a gentleman's wealth from him. 
And so people protest when 1764, we get the first one, the sugar tax, and people will boycott sugar. The colonial legislatures will draft resolutions complaining about it. People march, demonstrate, protest, all that stuff. It will eventually be repealed. But the next year we get the Stamp Act. This is the big one where universally people are opposed to it, they protest it. There is a Stamp Act Congress, an actual like legislature made of people from all 13 colonies who they can't really legislate, but they draft petitions and resolutions begging the king, imploring the king, pleading with the king and parliament, please repeal this, it violates the constitution of Britain. You cannot do this, no taxation without representation. And they don't listen. Or rather they listen, but then they change their mind. They'll repeal the Stamp Act. And then two years later, they pass the Revenue Acts in 1767 and everything is taxed. So colonists again, lose their mind. Uh, they protest, they you know, challenge this in every conceivable way that they possibly can. And sometimes very violently, tarring and feathering people, riding people out of town on the rail, all those kind of old school ways of doing it. And people see conspiracies everywhere. People imagine that this is a conspiracy, not of the king, but of certain ministers within the king's cabinet that are jealous of our freedoms and our liberties and they wanna rob us of those, which is silly, but that's what people felt very much at the time. Um, so uh, let's see, where are we here? So this will continue, continue, continue. Finally, all the taxes are repealed after the Boston Massacre. Okay, we don't have time to get into all the facts of that, but the Boston Massacre occurs, the trial happens, and in the aftermath of the trial, two things happen to calm everything down, because it looked like you might have a revolution right there in 1770. The tension is released when A, the trial happens and John Adams defends the Redcoats and it comes out that colonists were kind of asking for it and, and um, sort of urging on the Redcoats and, and provoking them. But also parliament repeals all the taxes. So for three years from 1770 until 1773, there are no taxes and things kind of go back to normal and people think, okay, we won, we won this conflict. Then the Tea Act is passed in late 1773, which enrages colonists. Then we have the Boston Tea Party where people actually break into a, a docked ship in Boston Harbor. They destroy all the tea because there was this one penny per pound tax on it, which was very low. But again, it's not the amount of taxation. Do not be misled where some people imagine that the revolution was about oppressive taxes that were taxing people into poverty and they had to rebel just to survive. No. The taxes in America were lower still, even with these taxes than anywhere else in the world and certainly lower than in Britain. I think one estimate is that they were 20 times higher in Great Britain than they were in, in America, which you know, one might say, what do we have to complain about? It's not the level of taxation, it's the principle, right? I mean, imagine tomorrow if they said, hey, uh, certain people in America are not gonna be given citizenship, right to a fair trial or vote, but you don't have to pay taxes anymore. Well, that's second class citizenship. Sure, you won't have to pay taxes, but you're not treating someone as an equal under the law and constitution. So after the Boston Tea Party, Parliament passes the Intolerable Acts. And this is a huge escalating act that if Britain had done anything else, ignored the Boston Tea Party or repealed the taxes, you probably wouldn't have had a revolution, but because they brought the hammer down and destroyed freedom, yanked the governor, Governor Hutchinson, got him out, and put in Thomas Gage, a military general. We always thought, well, we have the right to govern ourselves. No, 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 that's what we give to you, but we can revoke it. Just like your parents will say, all right, you had this right, but now I'm taking it away because you messed up. You're now on you know, restriction. Same thing, we were shocked. We thought we had the right to govern ourselves. We thought we had the right to you know, freedom of uh, religion and assembly. Nope, churches were shut down because people would go to churches and meeting houses to debate all these issues. Right to fair trial was taken away. The Quartering Act allowed uh, the king to just put troops in people's homes. It was a massive violation of English liberties. King would have never gotten away doing this in England itself, but because it was the colony, it was like, these are the stepchildren of the empire and I'm sick and tired of it. So colonists formed the first Continental Congress. 12 of the 13 colonies are represented. They try to fight against this, but they're not arguing revolution or even war yet at this point, yet the war eventually will come. In 1775, in April, 
finally, the Massachusetts militia kind of reconstitutes itself in this struggle over whether or not the British are going to seize the armory. They go out there, they get in this skirmish, and violence erupts, and the Second Continental Congress snaps into action. They now have all 13 colonies. Georgia didn't want to participate the previous year, but they jump in after Lexington and Concord. It unifies all the colonies. It snaps everybody else out of it. Everybody else was up to this point saying, well, these are hotheads in New England. We sympathize with you, but we can't join the struggle. Now everybody joined. George Washington leaves the Second Continental Congress, becomes a general and leads the army, and we plunge headlong into war. It's decided we got to fight for our liberties um, because they're not going to be granted to us otherwise. And then these two documents come out in 1776. The first is Common Sense. Thomas Paine writes this wonderful piece of propaganda, comes out early 76, I think in January. And um, it argues very simply and plainly that the time has come. We have matured. We don't need Great Britain anymore. We could be a great country on our own. But we would be smart to declare independence. After that, and after negotiations failed, you know, we tried to negotiate with the king and get our independence, or at least a repeal of the Intolerable Acts. He refused, he rejected that petition. And the bloodshed had really escalated it. Now that there's open armed conflict, people were more willing to say, all right, let's declare independence. So by the summer of 76, the people are on board in all 13, well, 12 of the 13 colonies voted to declare independence. The one holdout was New York. They abstained. They didn't vote against it. The reason for that was that Britain had uh, um, assembled the largest fleet the world had ever seen, and it was docked right off the coast in Manhattan. And they were very worried that if they voted for independence, the British would angrily come in and burn the city, which they did anyway. By the way, a lot of people don't know this, but the British set fire to New York and burned down huge ports and acted very brutally. In fact, there's a fascinating study that was just recently done about New York accents. If you guys have ever known, they talk really weird in New York City, right? Like the Jersey Shore folks, you guys know all those people. Um, it is argued that the reason why the accent in New York is so different is because of the occupation during the war, that the British stayed in New York for about uh, seven years and that everybody kind of sucked up to them because they had all the money, all the laundresses and restaurant owners and hotel owners and all that stuff all sold to the British and the dominance of their numbers kind of changed the accent because it's kind of crazy there, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? All the kind of Fran Drescher crazy, you know, accents that they have there, right? Um, anyway, New York voted against it. Everybody else voted for revolution. And so we declare independence. So going into chapter seven, the revolution. So people had to choose sides. It's estimated we didn't have polls back then, but you know the best estimates indicate that probably society was split into thirds, that a third of people were hardcore patriots and wanted independence. And they had kind of an oversized influence because it represented all the elites, all the politicians. Basically, we won the revolution at the outset because at the moment of the revolution, each of the colonies declared independence and British authority evaporated immediately. All of the royal governors fled. And so the colonists won their independence pretty much right there at the moment. The British would have to come in and overturn it in order to win, and they failed to do that. They could come into certain colonies at a time, but they were always chased out and eventually lost. Um, another third of society was loyalists. They were Tory. They were either recent immigrants from Great Britain or Anglican clergy or British customs duties officials or judges or people that just love being British. And that was probably a third of society. And then you had a third that were so-called fence sitters. They were neutral. They said, well, I'm not gonna run out and join the Patriot Army, but I'm also not gonna you know, support the British cause because I don't know who's gonna win and I don't wanna get killed when the war is over. And so a lot of people just sat the war out. Patriots would win, of course, but uh, you know, nobody knew that at the time. The big turning point of this war is Saratoga. We don't need to get into all the details, but the Patriots, after losing quite a bit in 1776, turned the tide the next year in 1777 in October, ambushed the British general Johnny Burgoyne out there, captured some 10,000 redcoats and, and Native American allies. This gave a huge boost to the Patriot cause, and most important, it convinced King Louis, 
who was meeting with Ben Franklin and John Adams at the time that we were serious. His, we were offering, or we were asking for him to give us support, give us help, financial and you know military assistance. He was very reluctant. He thought, I just fought a war with Great Britain. It didn't go very well for us. And I don't know how serious you are. He kind of viewed us that you are British. I don't think you're that really want our help. And that convinced him, Saratoga convinced him, okay, I can get my revenge this way. So here you go, blank check. Gave us money, gave us weapons, gave us his Navy and gave us military advisors. Lafayette it was wonderful. And you know, again, it's been a difficult friendship. It's weird, France is our oldest ally, but they're one of our most difficult allies. I just mentioned in class recently that we have all these military bases all over Europe and the world. The French are one of the few countries that refuse to allow Americans to stay in their country because um, it kind of wounds their pride. But they are our oldest ally and were very generous at the outset, gave us everything we asked for and more. Um, they got nothing after the war was over. They got no land back and we told them they were gonna get no land back. Um, so we owe it to them. We win the war largely because of them. At Yorktown, the British exhausted, finally surrendered in October of 81. And by March of 83, we have a peace agreement and we are our own independent country. Um, we gain independence for ourselves, but also the big bonus is all the land in the West. All that land that we wanted since 1754 in the French Crescent is now given to the United States of America, a now free republic. The constitution we would set up is really just sort of the second continental Congress, like the existing system that was sort of created in an instant, but like never written down is now sort of ratified. And we say, okay, let's just write down the rules for this. And that will be called the Articles of Confederation. A uh, few successes is the land ordinance, how land would be chopped up and sold to individuals. Um, and then um, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which gives all the land in the West to the federal government. Remember all the troubles uh, of Ohio that Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut almost went to war over who would get that land. No state would get the land. It would be the federal government's land. It would belong to everyone. People move there. It's a territory for a time. And then after sort of a tutorial period, it would become a state co-equal with the rest of the United States. So um, weaknesses of the articles, well, they are myriad. There's thousands of examples of this, but they all point in the same direction, which is the founding fathers were obsessed with preventing a future tyranny. They had just come through the revolution and they wanted to create a government that was weak and decentralized, that states would kind of be sort of independent units. There would be a sort of weak confederation, a republic that we would get together on a few issues, but they did not want to grant the federal government a whole lot of powers. And that experiment largely failed. In every possible way, the failure of the articles was the central government was too weak. Central government could make a national currency, but the states could make their own as well. The national government could not have its own army, but each of the 13 states could have their own army and their own navy. The states controlled their own harbors, their own ports, and had their own treaties with other nations, their own tariff agreements. They, they would actually have tariff and trade agreements between other states, so it was just a mess to try to figure out all the, all the complicated laws uh, to do trade. Um, and men like Hamilton got upset that States would borrow money from New York and then pay them back in their own currencies, inflating you know, their Rhode Island dollars and, and paying off their debt with that. Um, hyperinflation because the federal government printed out all this currency to pay off their debts to France. Just one disaster after the other, culminating in Shays' Rebellion, which is the biggest of these failures, that a bunch of farmers frustrated from not getting their pension rose up, took over all the courthouses in Western Massachusetts and took over half the state. And it really showed that if you have too much freedom, that actually is oppressive. It sounds weird and paradoxical, but it's very true that if you just let people do whatever the heck they want, you know, imagine a Millican where they just let people do whatever they wanted, where bullies will kind of, you know, form and they will prey upon students and without, you know, a strong administration and, and teaching staff to rein that in, you know, the students will be picked on and they'll be bullied, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can come up with dozens of examples of think of the COVID restrictions, right? As difficult as they are, if the government doesn't come in and make people mask up, then you get other people sick. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you can have a government that sort of by not 
doing enough, you are oppressing because you let the weak take advantage uh, or you let the strong take advantage of the weak. That was Shay's rebellion in a nutshell. And Hamilton and Madison got infuriated at this. And, and really they were almost conservatives in this, that they felt that Daniel Shays was some poor, ignorant farmer that frankly has not really read John Locke and doesn't understand the revolution. And he's saying, hey, this revolution needs to continue. The elites have sold out our revolution, we need to continue it. In France, this happened as well, and it spiraled out of control and led to sort of a fratricidal civil war. In America, the elites kind of quashed the guys like Daniel Shays who were taking this. The revolutions usually unleash all these crazy forces. Like, okay, the authority's gone, let's do whatever the heck we want. We won't respect anything. That was tamped back down during the Constitutional Convention. So the convention is held in the summer of 1787. Hamilton, or sorry, uh, Madison is the standout of this. James Madison, very young attorney from Virginia, largely writes most of the Constitution himself. He's on all the key committees and he brokers most of those agreements. Um, representation would be solved. It, under the articles, every state had equal representation. We make a bicameral legislature where the Senate is equal, but the House is proportional. So states like Virginia are happier now. Um, this issue of slavery rears its ugly head. Um, how will slaves be counted in the census, right? Virginia wants to count slaves because they're the biggest state, but if they don't count their slaves, then Massachusetts is the biggest state. And so you have this weird paradox where slave owners are arguing, no, slaves are people. We want them counted for the census so we have more power. And you have Yankees from Massachusetts who ended slavery after the revolution saying, no, 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 slaves are not human beings under the law. So therefore you, you can't count them. So have this awful part of our constitution that says, it doesn't say slaves are three fifths of a person, but it implies that and that's what they meant. They were embarrassed to have the word slave or slavery in there, so they left it out, but everyone knew what they meant when they said it. Three fifths of all other persons, that meant slaves. Slave owners are allowed to continue to import slaves for 20 years from 1788 to 1808, because they were very worried. Oh, Charleston, we control our own harbor so we can buy slaves from Africa. But if we turn our port over to the national government, they could end it, right? We'd have to allow Yankees from Connecticut to have a say in our port. We don't want that, at least for 20 years. So they protected that way. And then fugitive slaves. If slaves escape their plantation and go to northern states, they have to be turned back over. Northern states have to comply with that. And so slavery will be protected and in fact strengthened under our constitution, unfortunately. But there are also wonderful things there. You have three branches of government now, so laws will be better enforced. <clears throat> the government would be able to tax and collect and pay off debts and have retirement plans for our veterans. Stronger army would be made to, to keep the peace. Um, and, uh, and a bill of rights would be added to protect the rights of citizens, which was a good thing. This will be ratified. There's a big debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists over it, but the Federalists would win. Hamilton, Madison, and Jay would write the Federalist papers and they would be wonderful pieces of propaganda that would convince people and now they're studied as kind of the roots of American democracy. Um, so we have a new constitution and a new president. George Washington was tapped uh, out of retirement and begged to be the new leader of this government. Extraordinary when you think of you know, Napoleon or Cromwell or Caesar, how they wanted to have power and they demanded a share in power. Washington said, you know, I don't really want any power. I just wanted to free a nation and then go back home. Um, and he was begged to come out of retirement and, uh, and lead the country again. So he does. He will serve two terms and kind of set the standard for America. Uh, his cabinet was divided, but not in a partisan way because there were no parties at that time, but it was very clear that there were Hamiltonians and Jeffersonians. These were the two outstanding personalities from his cabinet. Hamilton, the Northern Yankee, immigrant from the Caribbean, uh, very smart, very capable banker uh, and lawyer. And then Jefferson, the landowning aristocrat, born in America, um, very, very different on this. Hamilton wanted strong central government. Jefferson wanted power to the states. Hamilton wanted a standing army. Jefferson wanted there to be almost no army, pretty much, just you know, a few hundred or a few thousand soldiers, and that was it. Um, Jefferson idolized the French. Hamilton idolized the English and British, um, and on and on and on. Right. Jefferson had the notion that that the quintessential pure American was the farmer, the yeoman farmer. That was the most virtuous citizen. Hamilton had no problem with them, but said really the future of America will be the industrial worker in cities, just like it is in Great Britain. 
uh, in banking. So Hamilton is the pragmatist, you know, from a realistic standpoint, Hamilton wins the debate, that's who we are today. Um, but from sort of a, a ideological perspective, we still idealize, you know, Jefferson's notions of states' rights and constitutionalism and all that. So Hamilton's plan for the new country in 1791 under this new government was a three-point plan. Number one, we need a national bank. We need to put revenue, our tax money, into a national bank that can then loan money out and create more wealth, stabilize currencies, and regulate our trade and our currencies. Um, remember that it's very weird and confusing, but technically there was no national currency until the Civil War. There were dollars, but each bank made its own dollars, basically. And so everybody had paper money from every different bank imaginable, but there were regulations on it, like you have to have X amount of silver in your vault, and it has to be fluctuating at a certain exchange rate on the open market, et cetera. And Hamilton wanted a strong national bank to have those regulations. Jefferson said, we shouldn't even have paper money. I don't want it. Just said, paper money, it has no intrinsic value. How could you even use it? It's got to be gold and silver. Jefferson, genius that he was, did not understand banking very well. Hamilton understood it quite well, which is amazing because he was self-taught. He just picked up a book and read it and said, ah, I get it. Rather extraordinary. Jefferson had all the tutors in the world that babied him since he was a child. He spoke five, six languages, but couldn't grasp modern banking. Um, then we've got kind of the foundation of our relationship with Native Americans in the West that a lot of people thought, well, now that the revolution's done, we're going to have peace with the Native American tribes because they don't have this, you know, this big ally anymore. But they would. The British would always be kind of meddling in American affairs. Uh, equipping, arming, training, you know, Native American tribes in, in the Northwest. And big problems emerge in Ohio when settlers start to move in. Without authorization, they start to move on to Native American land. There will be attacks. And then Uncle Sam will send in reinforcements. There's a really ugly massacre of a lot of settlers that move into Ohio. They were encroaching on Native American land. And so Little Turtle, the great Maumee chief, unified all the tribes of Ohio and attacked them, desecrated their bodies by cramming dirt down their throats. And uh, Americans were livid at this. Arthur St. Clair is fired. Washington sends in Anthony Wayne. And Anthony Wayne defeats Little Turtle and forces them to sign the Treaty of Greenville, which gives all of Ohio to the federal government. So under the Intercourse Act of 1790, it's actually progressive on paper. It says that Native American tribes are dependent nations that they exist within the US and they're sort of a state within a state, but inferior to both the federal government and the state that they live in. But they do have certain rights. They're not citizens, they can't vote as individuals, but their tribe can sue the federal government and can make treaties. And they have the land that they're on and the land can't be taken except by treaty. And so it was assumed that treaties would always be fair and that we would always pay Native American tribes for the land taken, but usually the circumstance is that it's taken under threat. And that over and over again, the US government will go back tearing up old treaties and saying, just kidding, what we gave you last time, we're taking another half of it. And then 10 years later, coming back and saying, we're taking it even more. That's all set up in 1790 in, in Ohio. Uh, and then another problem of the West was sort of this independence, um, meaning people who live in the West are always kind of independent minded and have this sort of hatred for Washington, DC. Um, if you look at a lot of these, you know, cattle ranchers and cowboys that live out in Utah and Nevada, they usually are very antagonistic towards the federal government. That was true back in the, in the colonial times and ever after. A bunch of whiskey distillers were very angry that they were having to pay the excise tax on whiskey. Revenue came from a number of sources. So land sales in the West would go to the federal government. Uh, the tariff, all money collected on imports would go to the federal government and the excise tax on it distilled spirits like whiskey would go to the federal government. So these farmers got very upset because if they sold grain, it's pure form, they could keep their profits. But once they distilled it, they had to pay a tax on it. And they just were very enraged. And so after the revolution, they kind of got amped up like, yeah, no taxation without representation. This is not fair. And Washington's attitude was, yeah, but Pennsylvania gets representation. You don't live in Ohio. That's a territory. You live in Pennsylvania. You got to pay your taxes. You get representatives. You have representatives. You have senators. The revolution is not do whatever the hell you want and thumb your nose at society and government. It is no taxation without representation. You have representation. You're just 
advocating that you want to be a law unto yourself and everyone has the right to rebel whenever. So Washington sent an army of 13,000 soldiers leading it himself as general into Pennsylvania to make an arrest of about 60 people in West Pennsylvania. Many people would say it was an overreaction, but it was to send a signal to the world that there's a new sheriff in town. This is not the silly articles of confederation. This is not Shays' rebellion. This is the Whiskey Rebellion and law and order are going to rule. Um, the new government is going to sign some very controversial treaties. The first one, Jay's Treaty, is very controversial. This has to do with British fortresses in the north that still had not been abandoned, that they had agreed in 1783 that they would leave them. Ten years later, they still had not left them, largely because they were angry at us for seizing all the property of the Tories, which we had promised we wouldn't do. We kicked them all out and took their land. Um, and so they were remaining in the fortresses. Finally, they agreed to leave the forts if uh, we would grant them most favored nation status, a sort of preferential trade agreement that would benefit the British over the French in our trade deals. Jefferson and the Francophiles, of course, were enraged at this. Number one, they wanted to attack the fortresses and drive the British out. They thought that we were kowtowing and capitulating to Britain, becoming a colony again. And they, they wanted to favor France in these deals. Um, Pinckney's Treaty, which is made with Spain, is much more successful. In the South, American colonists were on the wrong side of the border in Florida, and so we had to remove those people and solidify the border with Spain and do that, and that's a much more successful treaty. They shut off the Port of New Orleans to get our attention, so all these farmers in Ohio and Kentucky couldn't get their goods down the Ohio and Mississippi to get them out to, um, to England with New Orleans shut off, and so this was a warning we better get our hands on New Orleans because he who controls New Orleans controls the continent. And then we got stuck in the middle of this Anglo-French war that emerged after the French Revolution. In 1792, France declared war on Austria. The next year they declared war on England and all of Europe would go to war with each other. America decided to sit it out, thankfully, but France was begging us to help. They were all alone in Europe. Everyone in Europe, all the monarchies said, well, we have to overturn this revolution in France so that our peasants don't get the idea of having a revolution. Uh, and France said, well, you're a Republic of America. How about helping us? And we snubbed them. We said, sorry, we can't help. Ambassador Genet showed up in, um, in 1793 in Philadelphia to ask for our help. And Washington said, no, we're not going to help you. We're going to proclaim neutrality. Stay out. So now France will turn on us and start the quasi war. They will seize American ships all over the oceans, all over the world. They will, um, they took some $300 million worth of cargo, uh, abuse a lot of American sailors, kidnap them, doing all kinds of bad stuff. So Adams, the new president by this time has had enough of this. He decides he's gonna have to take a number of measures. Number one, let's build a huge Navy that will Escort merchant vessels across the Atlantic. If the French try to commandeer our ships, we'll fire on them. And he was encouraged by Hamilton to build a standing army and he did not want one. He was terrified that Hamilton would use this army which would be led by Hamilton in a coup and take over the presidency. So no standing army, but a large Navy. And more importantly, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Adams obsessed with how he was portrayed in the press. They were much meaner to him than Washington. And so Adams said, we need to stifle all these people that are criticizing me. So this law is passed where any criticism of the government would mean fine and imprisonment for citizens and deportation for non-citizens. And this was a flag flagrant violation of the First Amendment. I mean, only seven years after the Bill of Rights was written, the government is violating very directly freedom of speech, which shows you our founding fathers weren't as progressive as we are today. And they kind of felt, well, you can have freedom of speech in normal times, but in wartime, you can kind of quash it a little bit. Um, and this became kind of an internal struggle. Jefferson and you know all the Francophiles, uh, all, the, all the people that became known as Republicans would argue um, that this was not right. This was unconstitutional. It was tyrannical. And they called themselves Republicans in that they wanted to be citizens of a republic and a constitutional government and arguing that the Federalists were really monarchists, and that's what they wanted, which was not all that far off. That's not what Adams wanted, but Hamilton certainly had certain monarchist tones to him. Um, so 
How does one challenge an unconstitutional law? Well, now we understand it. You hire a lawyer, you sue, right? You find someone who's been injured by this, someone arrested and imprisoned or fined or deported, and you sue the federal government and you ask the Supreme Court for a leap. And if the court rules in your favor, the action is reversed. The Republic was so new and people were divided. Now, Hamilton wrote a lot of essays on this uh, in the Federalist Papers explaining that this was how it was gonna work, but a lot of people didn't accept that. A lot of people said, Hamilton's the authority on the constitution, that guy's a monarchist, we don't agree. So Jefferson said, no, the remedy when there's an unconstitutional act is the states will just overturn those laws. So he argued that Virginia and Kentucky could pass resolutions or laws that would overturn the federal law, which if you extrapolate this and kind of do a thought experiment, this would mean that there is no federal law whatsoever. Imagine if any state could kick the post office out or any military base out or any regulation they don't like they could overturn. We would not have a nation and, and states like Texas would basically overturn every federal law that, that existed. So this cannot be the right answer if we're to be one nation. But they were thinking outside the box. So they passed the Virginia and um, Kentucky resolutions. This is known as nullification, that states would nullify federal laws. It's a doctrine for a few decades, but the Civil War largely killed that. So um, the XYZ affair, we don't need to get into that a lot, but it was um, essentially John Marshall, before he becomes Chief Justice, is sent to France to negotiate with Foreign Minister Talleyrand. Talleyrand demands a bribe just to sit down and talk to them. Uh, we're at war, we need a lot of money, so give us some ridiculous amount, like $5 million. And this was declined, and Adams said, all right, well, we have to release the names of these agents, although we'll you know, protect their identities, but we'll release the fact that it happened, and this is known as the XYZ affair. Opinion went right behind you know, Adams, and people said, all right, we have to get ready for war. Um, eventually, Adams would lose the election of 1800 for months. It was disputed because no one got a majority. You know, basically it was a three-way race between Burr, Jefferson, and Adams. Adams comes in third, but Burr and Jefferson tied and there was no majority. So it went to the House and the House deadlocked for some 33 separate elections. So as late as February, we had no idea who the president was. Finally, Hamilton broke the deadlock and said, Federalists quit voting for Adams, he's lost. The lesser of two evils is Jefferson. Jefferson's a fool, but he's an honest fool. Burr is a scoundrel and a liar, and you can't believe anything he says, which hopefully explains to you why Burr shot the guy for saying those kind of things about him, right? Jones into a duel. What is the revolution of 1800? Well, it's kind of twofold. Number one, it is the first time in American history where we had a peaceful transfer of power. Now you might say, well, what about 1796? Washington stepped down and Adams won, right? Yeah, but the incumbent president left. Uh, if, say, Washington had run against Adams and Adams won and Washington didn't want to leave, it's kind of unclear. And probably most of the country would have supported Washington just negating that election or canceling it. Washington did not do that. He left and it was two non-incumbents, Jefferson and Adams running against each other. Uh, and so that doesn't really count as a transference of power. The transference of power would be when Adams lost in 1800 and like a grown up adult took his lump, said, okay, I lost and left. Many other countries, it doesn't work this way. And for most of American history, people just sort of say, well, yeah, America, this is what we do. We couldn't become a dictatorship, right? We have these principles. Um, look at our last election. Some people didn't take the loss very well and tried to overturn the election results violently by storming the Capitol. And I hate to say it, but that's the way most of the world works is people do not take it very well when, you know, when they lose and they use these kind of extreme measures, they deny that they lost. Um, and it's very dangerous, you know, to do those kind of things. And this is why 1800 is tantamount to a revolution because amazingly Adams let, now he, he did a lot of shenanigans in the last couple of months. They passed a ton of laws that allowed him to pack the courts and nominate all these people to jobs. And once they get in there, they have lifetime appointments. And so it's kind of like jamming key or uh, gum in the locks right before you leave, you know, right when you're fired, you're like, all right, before I leave, I'm going to just, you know, unplug the keyboard and, you know, uh, 
put gum in the locks and just, you know, steal everything and stuff like that. And that's largely what, what Adams did, but he left. He took his lumps and he left. The other way that it's a revolution is that it was basically a, a social revolution, um, meaning that this is basically a generation after our revolution, after 1776. America was a very young country, meaning that most people were under 30. They had no knowledge of the colonial period. And so you had a generation of people, some 75, 80% that did not know America had, I mean, they knew America had been a, a colony, but they didn't have that firsthand knowledge. And they were raised to believe that they were free men and women. They could think for themselves. There was no king ordering them what to do. And that they need to think for themselves and question authority and make their own mistakes. The Anglican church completely imploded after the revolution. And so, you know, there were churches in America, but largely there was a vacuum there because almost all the churches were associated with the old world. The Anglican church was the church of England. The Congregationalist church was affiliated in certain ways and the Presbyterian church was largely the Scottish national church. And so all of those churches would kind of break off and reform themselves, but it would take a couple decades. So most Americans weren't going to church at this particular time. They didn't have ministers telling them what to do every day. There was no king telling it and we have no ability. And so people made their own mistakes. And I, I mentioned this before, but it's really amazing how rebellious we were. Crime rates were unbelievably high. America has always been this very violent country. Violent crime is four or five times higher in America than every other advanced democracy. We're certainly not as bad as you know Mexico, Venezuela, you know a lot of these developing nations, but way higher than Canada or Britain or France or any of these other countries. And that goes back to this time period as well. Lots of murders, lots of people just saying, hey, my neighbor ticked me off. I'm not calling the police. I'll just take matters into my own hands. Um, there were riots on college campuses in the early 1800s because students said, we need to say in our education. There were riots over the poor quality of food and the curriculum and everything else, dress codes, dating rules, all kinds of stuff. Um, portraits changed. Families, this was a middle class thing, is that once every 10 years or so you get the family together and someone would paint your portrait. And in Europe, it was common for father to be standing and everyone else sitting to show the patriarchy there. Fathers in America would sit level with everyone else in the family showing equality. Um, servants, white servants, right? Indentured servitude would end. It would be no more after 1776. There would still be African slavery for quite some time. But indentured servitude would, would end and white servants got very uppity. Um, most servants were young women, mostly, who you know worked in white folks' homes and they got very challenging. They started to say, no, no, no. Uh, these are not the terms of service. I reject them because there was a labor shortage, they could do that. They didn't have enough workers to go work in people's homes. So they would make all these demands. Like, I don't clean windows. I don't wanna work on Sundays. I wanna be paid X, not Y. I wanna sit, I wanna eat in the big house with you. I wanna sit at the table with you. I want better quarters. And the saying emerges in America, which is so hard to find good help these days, that like American servants are incredibly uppity, not like in Europe where they do what they're told. And so, um, this became, becomes kind of an interesting uh, issue. And Americans are known for their rebelliousness in every possible way. And it, this led to some negative things too, like the alcohol consumption rate just went off the charts. Uh, 88 bottles of whiskey per adult per year were consumed in the United States. And we know that because there was a tax on whiskey. So people were drinking about seven, eight drinks a day, which is just insane and not a good thing. But you didn't have that authority of the nobility, the king, a, a, an established church that told people, you really shouldn't drink all the time. It's really bad for you and it's bad for society. You didn't have that. So people just drank a lot during this time. Um, also the illegitimacy rate, shocking that in 1800, the number of children born out of wedlock per capita was almost as high as it was in the 1960s and 70s. Not as high as today, but about as high as when the sexual revolution would take hold in the 60s and 70s, which is astonishing. Uh, we imagine everyone was prim and proper in 1800. No, not so at all. There was a shortage of men in New England. After the revolution, many young men, you know, you have these big families, seven, eight kids, and the boys tend to move when they reach adulthood and they move west to Ohio and Indiana where land is cheap and they can become landowners because New England was horrible land, rocky and, and very pricey. Uh, the women will stay. It's not appropriate or proper for young girls to pack up and move on their own to the West. They don't do that. And so what you had a lot of happening was boyfriends, girlfriends, they would get pregnant and the boy 
would run out on the girl and go to Ohio. And so you had a lot of single moms. You had a, a, you know, an overabundance of women per capita compared to men. And this was a bad thing. Uh, midwives write about this, that, that overwhelmingly on these birth certificates in 1800, you know, mother, you know, Jane Johnson, father, unknown, right? Or father moved to Ohio or whatever it was. So this is the revolution of 1800 also, and it's a mixed bag. There were some good results. I like that servants were getting kind of uppity. In fact, the very name that we use in America, boss, is borrowed from the Dutch um, because English speaking peoples don't like the term master. If you're a free white person, you say master is what a slave calls their owner. I'm a free white man and I don't wanna be called that. I wanna be called you know, something else. I'm your, I'm your, I'm the help. They use this term. I'm the help, not your servant. And I call you boss, which was a Dutch word. They were reaching for a new vocabulary. We still use it today. I, it's a very weird slang that's caught on is that people now call me boss. Like when I go out to any retail place, they're like, Hey boss, how's this going? I'm like, I'm not your boss, man. I'm just a customer. You don't have to treat me like an authority figure. It's a little weird, but we like this term. It's almost like in a term of an equal, right? Um, and so that's the revolution of 1800. This would be corrected by the Second Great Awakening, but it was an interesting phenomenon that happened in America. To this day, Americans don't trust authority, don't respect credentials, like I have three PhDs in climatology. I don't care. I read an article on a website, so I know about global warming more than you, right? I know Fauci worked as a you know infectious disease specialist for 45 years, but hey, I know more about coronavirus than you. You don't see that in most other countries. Most other countries, they're very respectful of authority and the elderly Americans not. And that's really a legacy of the revolution, both the 1776 revolution, but also the social revolution that followed in 1800. Okay, we're running out of time. We'll uh, try to finish as much as this material as we can. So uh, let's go to chapter nine, early Republic, where it's just kind of a you know, continuation there. So um, what can we say about the economy in the early Republic? Ooh, somebody have a question? Yeah. Um, so um, one economic phenomenon that took off in the 1790s was the shipping boom. New England was the center of the shipping trade uh, even before the revolution. It was amazing. Boston, I think, was the third largest shipping center in the British Empire all over the globe. Um, I believe Bristol was the number one. I think Liverpool was number two and Boston was number three. Boston becomes the shipping center of America because Britain and France were at war. They couldn't focus on trade. And so um, America shipped everything, even goods from British colonies. Like if you want to ship sugar from Kingston, Jamaica to London, it's in an American ship. It's in a ship made in Boston with a, an American crew flying under an American flag. So New England is making money like crazy in the 1790s. When the war ended, this would trigger a recession in America, but for a while it was great. Uh, we have this Supreme Court ruling, which is hugely important. You don't need to know all the ins and outs of it because it's a very technical, complicated case. But Marbury versus Madison would set up this standard that I mentioned a moment ago that if the federal government violates the constitution, you settle it through peaceful means by suing the government in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will strike it down. This was the first time the Supreme Court struck down an act of Congress in 1803. They struck down part of the Judiciary Act of 1789. Brilliant decision by John Marshall to prove that the Supreme Court had judicial review. So the only thing I need you to really know about Mar Marbury versus Madison, the most important Supreme Court case of all time, is that it establishes judicial review, the principle that the courts can strike down an act of Congress. And that's how we deal with that. What if you have a tyrant president or Congress that violates people's rights? The courts are the balancing act. They can be the referee, throw up the flag and say, no, you can't do that penalty on the play. We don't need a revolution. We don't need assassinations. You know, we have elections, but we have the courts that will rein in things too. The Louisiana Purchase, when Jefferson gets in there is great success is buying the Louisiana territory from Napoleon. Jefferson had his eyes set on the West for quite some time. He adored the French. He, he believed in Republican agrarianism that if we all moved into cities like Hamilton wanted, it would be an oppressive society. It wouldn't be a free, free society, that the only way to have a free Republic was a citizenry of yeoman farmers. So let's buy all the land in the West and encourage people to move there. And then we'll be a free society independent of 
bosses that tell you what your wages are or the government who rules over you or you know, whatever, or being just a agricultural worker on someone else's land will be exploited too. He hires Lewis and Clark to go and explore it and they chart all this you know, undiscovered territory and uh, bring back all the knowledge to, uh, to the East Coast. Um, it doubled the size of the US. It did it for a pretty low price of $15 million and it was done pretty peacefully. Um, the Embargo Act. So Jefferson's biggest failure, if Louisiana purchases his great success, is the Embargo Act. He had this crazy notion that he could stop impressment. Impressment is the British kidnapping our sailors. Remember that so many sailors were defecting and jumping ship uh, from the British Navy and they would join American merchant vessels, that they would commandeer American vessels to find these people, thousands of them. And we argued, no, those are American citizens who have defected. They said, no, they're British, you know, naval people that are des deserters. And so he said, all right, we'll, we will correct this by embargoing you. We're not going to trade with you. And um, it didn't work. And in, in fact, devastated our economy. And by the way, most historians would tell you that this was more um, tyrannical and draconian than anything in the Alien and Sedition. I mean, as bad as the Alien and Sedition Acts were, it you have to look at the enforcement, right? Like a lot of libertarians and liberals will criticize Obama and say, Obama persecuted more you know, journalists than anyone in human history. And you look it up, eight people were arrested. And it wasn't the journalists, it was the leakers. It was like people who work for the CIA or NSA who illegally took information and leaked it to the press. And you know what, I, I kind of agree with those critics. I don't think the Obama administration should have gone after them, but it's eight people. We make it a deal like, Thousands of Americans were locked up in five, no, eight, right? Same thing with the Alien and Sedition Act. It was just, a, it was a small number. A few dozen people were imprisoned in five. It wasn't like Adams locked up half the country. Jefferson, on the other hand, under this policy, made it so that you could not buy foreign goods, that people in Vermont and um, New Hampshire couldn't cross the border into Canada and trade with the, the British there. This And it destroyed the Northern economy, the Yankee, uh, shipping economy was devastated by this. And so Jefferson, the great libertarian, did this, right? Huge mistake. And he, in fact, admitted it. And on his way out of office, he repealed it and said, oops, my bad. Big mistake there. This leads us into Madison and the War of 1812. So Madison, frustrated with impressment, tried to negotiate, tried to have these different deals. He kind of laid it on the table and said, you know, Britain, France, you're both kind of doing these antagonistic things. The first um, of you countries to make a treaty with us and stop all this. We will resume trade with you and stop with the other and work. Uh, we were not the big powerful country we are today and we were being played basically. So finally, Hamilton lost his, his cool. And in June of 1812, he asked the Congress for a declaration of war and we get one. Now we don't need to really get over the, get into the details of the war, but it will be a tie. It's a weird war where a treaty is negotiated. The whole reason to fight for the British was to defend impressment. But the war with Napoleon had ended. Napoleon had been exiled. And it was like, why are we fighting anymore? Let's just agree not to fight. The treaty doesn't solve any issues. The Treaty of Ghent doesn't actually say they would stop impressment or trade any money or land. Uh, it just says, let's stop fighting. But we fight and win the Battle of New Orleans after that treaty is fought, but before we get word that the war was over. And so we turn sort of a tie into a victory and say, Andy Jackson defeated the British and aren't we tough and awesome? Um, couple of things about the war. Number one, um, a bit scary that New England was possibly talking about secession and withdrawing from the government and uh, siding with Great Britain during this war. If the war dragged on a little longer, it was possible we would have had civil war. Um, second, is that we went bankrupt during the War of 1812 because Madison stubbornly refused to recharter the second national bank in 1811. So we had no national bank to tax and spend. And it, it was ridiculous and crazy, but that's what happened. So the lesson afterwards is let's recharter the bank, which they do in 1816. Uh, and industrialization is a, a weird side effect of this as well because prices of imports skyrocketed because of the British blockade during the war. Uh, Yankee industrialists said, man, I could make a fortune off of cloth, shirts, pants. So we steal British technology, build the first spinning loom in Lowell and factories open. Madison tours these factories after the war and says, what do you need? We need a national bank so we can get credit easily and get currency. He says, okay. So 
he recharters the, the second national bank. Um, one of the biggest legacies of this will be the defeat of the Native American tribes in the Northwest, that Tecumseh valiantly fighting to defend his territory and land is defeated. The British were his major ally. That resistance movement falls apart and the US can just steamroll through Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and have further colonization and Native Americans are moved further west. Same thing in the Southwest, Andrew Jackson defeated all of the tribes of the Southwest, the Cherokee, the uh, Maumee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Seminoles, and basically took all of their land in the Southwest. So the West used to be a very violent, dangerous place to go, everything up to the Mississippi. <clears throat> now it was very safe and peaceful and you could buy your land and move there if you were white, I guess. Um, so, um, well, we're at 501, so why don't we go ahead and end there. If I forget, please remind me, we're right here on Clay's American System. I think we made pretty good progress. I hope that this was useful to you all, that you enjoyed it and that you learned a little bit and it's helping you review. If not, it won't hurt my feelings if you don't show up at the next one. But that's it. We'll meet again um, Saturday, 9 to 11. Uh, I'll send you an email about that one, a, a reminder as well. Probably it'll be on Zoom again. I'm gonna see if I can do it on YouTube. Um, but that's effectively it. Questions, concerns at the end? Oh, awesome. All right, good. Um, guys are very, very nice. All right, guys, study, study, study. Test is six days away. It's all up to you at this point. So study as hard as you can, okay? Uh, I'll see half of you tomorrow. The other half, I'll see you Tuesday, okay? Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, Bye, you. thank you. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Thanks.